nation to them, children of the night. What music they made. That, of course, was a line that Bela Lugosi said in Dracula. When I was a little boy, on TV, they used to have all the old movies. That one station would have the gangster movies, the other one would have the monster movies. And I fell in love with the monster movies when I was a kid. I used to, like, walk around with, like, a blanket around me and just, I knew the entire Dracula film. It's like, to die, to be really dead, must be glorious. There are far worse things awaiting man than death. So it, it, it's so much. Anyone who's ever heard me on the Howard Stern show... Howard always asked me to do my Bela Lugosi imitation, and they they call me Dracula Godfrey on the show because of my love for Lugosi and for Boris Karloff. And, you know, I uh, sadly, I can't talk to Boris Karloff and Bela Lugosi, uh, but I got in touch with their kids who are a little older than just kids, but they were willing to talk to me. I spoke to Bela Lugosi Jr., the, the real son of Dracula, and Frankenstein's daughter, Boris Karloff's daughter, Sarah Karloff. And I called her up, and I said, It's Gilbert Gottfried. Uh, would you be on my podcast? And she said, I'd love to be on your podcast. Nothing would get me more excited. I'd be so thrilled to be on your podcast. So, today, we speak to Bela Lugosi Jr. and Sarah Karloff on Gilbert Gottfried's amazing Colossal Podcast. Hi, this is Gilbert Gottfried, and I'm here with my uh, sidekick, Frank Sancho Prodre. Uh, I'm just learning to pronounce his name. <laughs> Episode 8. Yes. <laughs> One day I'll learn One it. day. And this is the, the amazing Colossal Podcast. And... Um, this is anyone who knows me uh, from the Howard Stern show knows that how how many times I've imitated Beta Lugosi as Dracula on the show where they start calling me Dracula Gottfried on Hollywood Squares for their Halloween uh, special. They had me total Dracula makeup. And uh, so that's why it, it's such a treat for someone uh, who is a horror kid like myself to be talking to this next man, Bela Lugosi Jr., Bela's son. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Gilbert. Now, I have to tell you, you know, as, as a kid who used to stay up at nights and sit Right, an inch from the TV, so I wouldn't wake my parents up when I was watching Dracula late at night, <laughs> movies like that, that I got an email from you that said, Dear Gilbert, uh, give me a call. Uh, thank <laughs> you, Bill <Bela> Lugosi. <laughs> and I thought, boy, when I was a kid, to have thought I'd get a letter like that. <laughs> that was just amazing. Now, well, you, I get that every once in a while. And I wanted to ask you, too, you're like, first of all, the idea of having such an iconic name. Uh, and it's so, number one, your whole life you must have had people doing Lugosi imitations to you. Right. And... and to make matters worse, you became a lawyer, which lawyers are always called bloodsuckers. 
So that must have added more ammunition. So what was it like growing up with that name? Well, you know, uh, when you're a school-age kid, it's, you like to blend in with the lockers. And so my name was giving me too much attention. So I, I actually started going by Bill instead of Bela, thinking that would help. But it didn't. You know, <laughs> People have recognized that name every day through today. It happens all the time. It's a funny thing because, I mean, Lon Chaney Jr., uh, he changed it to Lon Chaney Jr. from Crichton Chaney. But he regretted being Lon Chaney Jr. his entire life. He, he regretted the name. So... What what was it like that for you? Did it at times? No, no, because I didn't try to follow follow in his footsteps, and I did something so totally different than what he did, and I never tried to trade off my name as far as the law business goes, but uh, you know, people took me seriously just because of my profession, and uh, you know, had I tried to go into acting, and that would have caused the problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can imagine. How, how old were you, Abela, before the, the realization of who your dad was really began to dawn on you, began to sink in? I mean, obviously, as a, as a little child, you wouldn't. Yeah, grade, yeah grade school, actually. Mm -hmm. And how, how so? Was it, was it because you were exposed, your, your dad exposed you to the films, or was, was, it, be, was it that you learned about it in, in, from your schoolmates? Yeah, you know, the word would go around that that's Bela Lugosi's son. Now, you were on the set of a few of his movies when you were a child. Do you remember anything about that? Well, I, I know I was on the uh, set of a, of a film when I was less than a year old because I've seen pictures, but I have no memory of it. <laughs> but anyway, I, the one I remember is that in Costello meet Frankenstein. I was 10 years old, and I remember that very well. Do you what what recollections do you have on that movie? That's one of my favorites. Well, a number of them. Uh, for one thing, you know, Dad could do a scene in one take, but other people in the scene would require you know five, ten, fifteen takes before they'd get it right. And that's because Dad prepared so much, you know, for his role. He was a real consummate professional. Uh, I also remember. The respect he got on the set, everywhere from the grips to the other actors. And then I remember uh, coffee break times when people would get some, from the cart some tea or some other beverage. I'd, I'd go there with Lon Chaney Jr. made up as, as, as the wolf, wolf man, <laughs> and, and Glenn Strange as Frankenstein. And they were they were both very nice to me. I remember that. And then uh, I also remember. Uh, the female lead, I, I thought she was beautiful. Lenore, um, I've forgotten her last name. Oh, God, now I have a block on that. But um, now oh, that, that brings me to uh, Lon Chaney Jr. So you, he was nice to you. Oh, yes. And because he has this reputation for alcoholism and... Uh, being a, an angry drunk and all, I, a lot of people had uh, bad feelings about him. But well, I, I just had that limited exposure. Yeah. So. I, I think I think Cheney Jr. liked kids. I think he felt comfortable around kids. Yeah, that's, I get that impression from his uh, grandson. And now that that brings up another subject that you, his grandchildren, and Sarah Karloff, Boris Karloff's daughter. Uh, you you help them, I guess, get the rights to their parents and grandparents' names, and get yes, some... there, yeah. There was a, a lawsuit that I brought in the uh, in the sixties because against Universal. The case is called Lagosi versus Universal, and Universal at the time was licensing quote, Dracula, unquote, but the pictures that they would give to the licensee was of my dad. And they did this, you know, without any permission or compensation to me. 
And so that's what the lawsuits started out to be about, but it uh, ended up being about whether or not the rights to your name and likeness for commercial purposes uh, continued on as a property right after your death. And uh, the, the, ultimately the, the court found that it did not, but then there is an effort in the California legislature to reverse that portion of the Supreme Court uh, decision, which they did, and and they declared, the legislature declared uh, that this was a property right, and they provided a whole system for enforcing those rights. Well, I remember years ago, they, I mean, the idea of... Uh... Beta Lugosi imitation or a Peter Laurie imitation in a commercial would just just open like anybody could do it without. No, any, that's not true. Yeah, but uh, but years ago. Anymore. It's yeah, okay. now you you changed it, but years that's ago right. it used to be like anybody could do a celebrity impersonation in a commercial. Oh yeah, there's always a, a ripped off. That's true. It wasn't the catalyst for this, Bela, that somebody brought you a... Was it a model kit? Yes, Back exactly. The, one, the, the old Aurora model kit. I know them well. Yeah. And you realized that it, was your, it wasn't just Dracula. They were using the name Dracula, but what? They were using your, your, your pop's likeness. Oh, yeah, clearly. And you, rep- you wound up representing... Tell, tell us about how you wound up representing some of the uh, heirs of the Three Stooges. Oh, there was a, a lawsuit... Uh, among the uh, heirs of the, of the three stooges uh, involving the accounting for monies and who owned the rights. And uh, I, I uh, participated in the trial of that action where we were successful on the, the, my clients. And then I went into the business with them of exploiting the rights to the Three Stooges, which I did for a number of years. Which, which is amazing to me, Bela Lugosi, re- Bela Lugosi <laughs> representing the Three Stooges. It's very strange. Well, they never were in a film together. <laughs> now, the, uh, another thing I was always curious about, it was a lot was always made about that uh Lugosi and Boris Karloff hated each other and had a feud going. I never heard that from my parents. I never saw that. So so this was something kind of maybe made up by the studio. I think so. Was the studio promoting that idea because they were usually depicted as, as enemies in, in their films, do you think, Bela? You know, I don't know, but I, you know, I've seen like little uh, like trailers and snippets where the two of them are, for example... Uh, uh, enjoying each other's company, playing chess or uh, things like that, which would be you know the act, exact opposite. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, I don't, I don't think there's any truth to that, not to my knowledge, anyway. I I remember seeing photos of you uh, as a little child standing between Boris Karloff's legs as the Frankenstein monster. That's right. So that was on the set. And so I remember I told you there was a movie. Son of where Frankenstein. I was on the set. Yeah. That was it. Oh, yeah. there you go. Which, which your father gave uh, this performance that people forget about how, how varied his talent was, that he was Igor, that yes. was totally different than Dracula. Yeah, he really, he really made that film uh, with that portrayal. And he enjoyed it, by the way. In later years, he always talked about it. You like the opportunity to do a little comedy. It's a very unsettling performance. It's a one. It's a wonderful performance. Yeah, yeah. It's you well, can. And oh, go ahead. Well, he's, you know, he's a good actor, so let's <laughs> see. Yeah, because part of the fun of watching both Son of Frankenstein and Ghost of Frankenstein is that uh, he looks like he's having fun. Yeah. 
The little twinkle in the eye. Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> I was asking this to, uh, about Gil, uh, asking Gilbert this before we sat down, Bill. I was talking about films like The Black Cat and The Raven and, the, you know, how, how campy some of those films were. And I said to Gilbert, I, I, I wonder if, if, if Bela Lugosi, you know, if he had, a, had that twinkle in his eye, if he had an appreciation for the absurdity you know, the, the the dialogue in The Black Cat comes to mind that Gilbert and I were just talking about. The supernatural, perhaps baloney, perhaps not. I mean, he must have known. Yeah. <laughs> it's such a, a great line. It's a wonderful line, and it's, it, it's, it's a wonderful spooky film. But I always want to watch that film every chance I get. And I always wondered, does, does, does he have, did he have some sort of sense of the absurdity of, of what well, he was yeah, saying? Well, yeah, I think so. He had a sense of humor. Mm-hmm. What curious changes it made in her? You must have noticed it. It is perhaps the narcotic. Hyocin affects certain people very oddly. One cannot be sure. Sometimes these cases take strange forms. The victim becomes, in a sense, mediumistic. A vehicle for all the intangible forces in operation around her. Sounds like a lot of supernatural baloney to me. Supernatural, perhaps. Baloney, perhaps not. Did he, did he did he know that that that, that, that that you know did he have his tongue in his cheek when he was doing it? There is a big age difference between me and him, and so we never had a discussion like that. Mm-hmm. What was that the, would be a, that would be a grown up discussion? <laughs> what was the age difference? Fifty six years. Wow. What was Lugosi? And I, I I realize I'm calling. <laughs> I should say your dad. Lugosi is getting confusing because both of you are. What what was uh, Bela Lugosi like as a father? Well, he was he was a, a good father. He was always trying to impart to me, you know, the wisdom that he had acquired over the years. Uh, took an interest in, you know, showing me and teaching me things, and uh, you know, was very very generous. As as a husband, though, I I guess is where. Uh, he got in uh, in trouble. It's like he was like he he was married. I think five times. Yeah, a number. Yeah, he was married to my mother for over twenty years. Wow, I had no idea it was that long. Yeah. So then that must have been a pretty successful marriage then. Yeah. Wow, that I didn't know. Let's let's talk a little bit about about Dracula and and about how he was. Uh, how many performances did he do? 261 performances, according to what I found online, on Broadway? Yeah. Before touring? Yes. And and is it true, I mean, I said there's some dispute about this, about whether or not the studio wanted, Universal wanted Lon Chaney for the part? Oh, that's, to, Todd that's what I've always heard. Mm-hmm. And that when, you know, he had a terminal illness, they had to pick somebody else, and so... Dad was not the first choice. I I heard it went so far as I don't know if it was Lemley or I it may have been Carl Lemley himself, head of Universal, who even sent out a telegram that said no Bela Lugosi. And and it's so odd to think of it now because to me, I mean to anyone, it's like I say in two thousand years from now. If you say to someone, do a Dracula imitation, they're going to do a Bela Lugosi imitation. Exactly. That's, That's true. exactly right. That's true. I was reading that yep. they went out to actors like Paul Muni and Conrad Veidt. I don't know if that's I don't know if that's true. Yeah, I don't either. But <laughs> <laughs> well, don't forget, I wasn't born until 1938. So right, he certainly made the part his own, didn't he? Certainly did. You know, it's funny. Iconic. They talk about. I remember when, when Frank Langella played the part of Dracula on Broadway, and and I remember at the time people making a big deal out of that. That it was the first time that the the, the character had sexuality. But uh-huh. but your father's Dracula was was always seemed sexual, always seemed smoldering. I, I remember seeing an interview with your father where he said he got loads of letters from women. Wanting to get bitten by him. Yeah, I, I heard that. <laughs> I've heard of that interview. <laughs> and I, it, it's funny, and, and that's another reason that I like Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, is because after Dracula, 
it's like they had other actors uh, playing Dracula. Like John Carradine and yeah, such, yeah. And, and, yeah, John Carradine, who I'm a big fan of, but he just wasn't Bela Lugosi in the part. And I, well, you know, that's like uh, watching the Spanish version, which they filmed on the same set except at night. Yes. And, and you know, people say that there's a lot of qualities of that film that are better than the, you know, the Universal Dracula that starred my dad. Except when you look at it, one thing is missing, and that's the male lead. It just it wasn't dad, and it just didn't carry itself. Mm-hmm. It's like when I watch, they had like um, House of Frankenstein and House of Dracula, where they brought all the monsters together, and John Carradine's Dracula, who I'm a fan of, but it's like every time I see those movies, I think, boy, imagine if Bela Lugosi had been doing Dracula here. Yeah, yeah. And and Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein had the sense to bring him back. Yeah, I just saw it this last weekend, as a matter of fact. Oh, yeah? Still holds up. Yeah. Holds up so well, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. And it's a comedy that's respectful of the monsters. Yes. Yeah, it's a... And you know, when I go out in the public make appearances, when I, that's almost the most talked about subject with me is that film. So it's really popular with the fans. And how did you get along with Abbott and Costello? Well, they didn't have anything to do with me. (laughs) (laughs) I guess that answers the question. Yeah. (laughs) Bela, what was the, what was the real reason? And maybe it was several reasons that he turned, that your dad turned down the part of the Frankenstein monster, because I read somewhere that it was the, he didn't want any part of the makeup, that it was the the lack of dialogue and the script. What, what do you, what do you attribute it to? It's the latter is what he told me. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. That, you know, it, it, it just, it was a dumb role. Uh, a, a role he would play years later. Stranger, stranger. Yeah. Strange. And, and it's like, uh, for people unfamiliar with it, he he kind of got, you know, he, he was attacked for giving a bad performance as the monster, but he kind of was screwed in the part because in the previous film, uh, that was... Um, Ghost of Frankenstein, where Lon Chaney Jr. was the monster, and uh, he gets Igor's brain in his body, which is a great scene of Lon Chaney Jr. talking <laughs> as the monster, it. and <laughs> and your father's voice coming out, going, "I am Igor," <laughs> and and then it's found out that. The brain, the blood type is different, and he's blind. Oh, that's right. He was blind, so he had to stumble around. So in the next movie, he was supposed to be blind during the whole part, first part of the film. And that's where the Frankenstein walk that everyone knows comes from. That's, 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 the, that's what's imitated. Yeah, they, they imitate uh, your father's walk because he was supposed to be blind and that's why his arms were outstretched. Right. And, um, but then at the last minute, the studio decided to change the fact that he was blind. So a lot of what your father was doing looks strange now. Because yeah, he, he was exactly. doing a blind man. And did he take the part the second time in, 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 in part, Bela, because he had so famously turned it down and, 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 and thought he had made a mistake? Did that factor no. into his thinking, you think? It may have just been to work. Mm-hmm. That's what actors desperately want to do. And a lot of people, I mean, like a younger generation of people who aren't familiar with old horror films, their their knowledge of Lugosi would be from Ed Wood. And yeah, the that's movie. at the end of his life. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. what what did you think of the movie Ed Wood? Well, it had a lot of inaccuracies, which were, you know, pejorative, and and uh, you know Martin Landau didn't write the script, but he did a wonderful job researching and portraying my dad at the end of his life. He he did a good job of that. But no, the film itself had a lot of, you know, bad things that were wrong. So, 
Do you remember any in particular? There's some very simple ones. One is, you know, he had German Shepherds and Dobermans, but they depict him as having these little lap dogs. And they depicted him as swearing all the time, but he didn't swear. Interesting. Things like that. Interesting. Did, did Sleep, sleeping in his, in his outfit, Dracula outfit. He didn't do that. He was supposed to have been, of what I heard, very dignified. And it, yes, he was. Yeah. Now, was he also, though, very old school? And as far as being, he was dignified, but could he be, like, cold to people? Well, sure. You know, he could play any part you want. <laughs> <laughs> did, did, were, were you, did Landau ever reach out to you at any point, Bela? Did, did he ever consult oh, with you about the, the oh, part? Oh, sh- no, 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 no consulting. After the fact, uh-huh. we, we got together. Oh, really? Yeah, had a good relationship. Oh, good. It, I mean, it must have been a little strange seeing someone winning an Oscar for playing your father. I know it was. <laughs> <laughs> But, but he, you know, he's a very humble guy. But Landau did say that he felt the accomplishment of getting the Academy Award, that he was winning it for Bela Lugosi. That that was yeah, the that award. was very nice. So I, I have to wrap it up now if you're uh, in a good place. Yeah, that was a lot of information, Bela. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And if we can ever have you back, I'd love to have you back. Yeah, maybe one day. Hello, this is Gilbert Gottfried, and I'm here with my co-host, Frank Santo Padre, and this is Gilbert Gottfried's amazing, colossal podcast. Now, I remember when I was a little kid in Brooklyn, I would be, uh, I'd watch my little black and white TV, I'd sit in front of it. I'd be, uh, you know, I didn't want to wake my parents up because the monster movies would come on late at night. And I remember watching movies like Frankenstein, uh, Bride of Frankenstein, Son of Frankenstein, and The Mummy, and House of Frankenstein, and uh, all starring Boris Karloff, who was one of the greats of uh, horror actors and one of the great actors of old Hollywood. And I figure I couldn't get Boris Karloff for this for obvious reasons, so I got the next best thing, Boris's pride and joy, his daughter, Sarah Karloff. Welcome to the show, Sarah. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be on your show. Nice to meet you, Sarah. Thank you. Nice to meet you, Frank. Now... Uh, everybody knows Boris Karloff as a very sinister, evil person in all the movies, but what was he like as a father? He was a delightful father and a delightful human being. He could not have been more different from the roles he played. He was just um, gentle, soft-spoken, had a lovely sense of humor. He was a typical uh, English gentleman. And actually, the roles he played, he was not really evil. He was really very often caught in the dilemma not of his own making. Now, he he was also like, he liked children. I and children liked him. He, he told me once that that children were not afraid of the, of the creature, that they seemed to understand that the creature was the victim and not the perpetrator, and that it was adults who were frightened, more so than children of the creature. Well, with Frankenstein, it was always like Frankenstein was basically a big kid, and uh, it was just every... So kids identified. He was like someone alone in the world, and he didn't have any friends, and uh, that's all he wanted was to fit in. Correct. Correct. And now, uh, also, uh, something I always have to ask is, uh, Boris Karloff always acted with uh, Bela Lugosi early on, and there was a lot made out of uh, them having a feud going. Did Was there ever any feud? Well, they made seven films together, uh, but there, there certainly was no feud. That was Hollywood hype, I think, to help... Uh, help box office draw. Um, they had a great deal of, 
professional respect for one another, but Bela being Hungarian had his own um, personal interests, and my father being British had his own personal interests. But there was no personal animosity between them, and there was a great deal of professional respect between them. Did you ever meet Lugosi? No, I know his son, Bela Jr., very well. We're good friends, but I never had the uh, opportunity to meet his father. Yeah, I know, because Bela Lugosi Jr. is a lawyer uh, who who fought to uh, so that you and the Cheneys and other people like that can get rights to their father's likenesses. Yeah, Bela was instrumental in um, helping write the um, um, civil code that protects the rights of deceased celebrities' families. And now, uh, Karloff, uh, in his horror movies, I heard it was like basically uh, an agreement that he had to have a tea break. <laughs> well, when my father made Frankenstein, he was not in a position to make any demands. No. <laughs> he, uh, Frankenstein was his 81st film, and no one had seen the first 80. It's amazing. And um, uh, no one expected... Uh, the film to be the huge success that it was, and certainly no one expected the creature to be the star of the film. They really anticipated that Colin Clive, who played Dr. Frankenstein, would be the star of the film. My father wasn't even invited to the premiere, wow. so um, there was there was certainly not, um, he certainly was not in a position to insist upon a team break. He was third billed, wasn't he, Sarah? He wasn't billed. Oh, he wasn't billed. He was in, if you watch the movie... He, he was, he, it was just a question oh, the mark. Question yes, mark the question monster. mark. You're right, you're right. Yeah, But by yeah. the second movie, that's Karloff. That's correct. Just and yeah, then in the, in the end said, running credits, uh, yeah, in the end running credits, his name is opposite the creature. But in the opening credits, it's just a question mark. But keep in mind, he wasn't even inv invited to the premiere. And you said he was a, he'd been a starving actor for two decades by the time Frankenstein came that, around. That's right. He was an overnight success after 20 years in the business. I remember, I think he was in, like, Scarface, the yes. original with Paul Mooney. He Moon. shot in the bowling alley. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. And, 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 uh, as I say, Frankenstein was his 81st film, and he was 44 years old when, he, and Bela Lugosi had turned down the role. The role would have gone to Cheney Sr. had he not, unfortunately, died prematurely. Now, is it true that Karloff was discovered in the commissary? Well, he was uh, spoken to by James Whale and asked to test for the role after Bela turned it down. I, I read a story with it that's something that, uh, to the effect that James Whale saw him in the commissary and, and liked the shape of his head. Is that a, is that a myth? Sarah's well, very interesting. Well, I've heard that it, he said to my father, you have an interesting face, Mr. Karloff. I see. And, and Gilbert and I were, were wondering, is it, was it because, uh, to your knowledge, that Lugosi turned down the part because he didn't want to go through the makeup tests? Or, well, or because reasons. there was a disastrous screen test. He did not want to um, perform under all that makeup. And uh, he didn't want a, to do a non-speaking role. Now, also, I, I love the, uh, the Grinch that stole Christmas. That's one of the very few times that my father called me and my children and said he had done something that he was just thought was delightful, just magical, and he <laughs> hoped that my two sons would sit down that evening and watch it because it was absolutely an enchanting, just an enchanting program, and he hoped I'd have an opportunity to watch it that night. And, I mean, my, you know, my father never brought his work home. He seldom talked about his work. He never talked about other actors, but he was so enchanted with, with How the Grinch Stole Christmas that he called me... And I was living in Arizona at the time, and he called me and specifically thought it was something that um, um, my kids and I would love sitting down and watching together. Didn't he win and he was absolutely right. Did he win a Grammy for the enchanting. performance, sir? 
Yes, he did. Uh huh. He did. But he was in England during. He he was in England at the time of the Grammy Awards, and so his agent Arthur Kennard went and accepted it for him. And then the next time my father came over to this country, and he went to his agent's office. And Arthur said, Boris, here's your Grammy. And my father, who was not into awards, um, looked at it and said, oh, it looks like a bloody doorstop. And took it and put it <laughs> put it down on the ground, uh, on the floor by uh, his agent's door and left it there. Now, there was a, a major hit song out years ago called The Monster Mash. Yeah, Bobby Boris Pickett did it. Yes. Now, I now, how did your father feel about uh, his voice being imitated in that move in that song? He I, he felt as well he should that it was a lovely compliment and it was the song itself was great fun. Now he was friends also with um, well Vincent Price. Yes, they were great friends. Uh, Vincent, of course, was uh, a great intellect and um, an avid reader and, um, of course, a great um, art aficionado. And um, he and my father had a lot of things in common, and they were very fond of each other. And, of course, they had worked together several times. And I, I think, well, also Peter Laurie he was friends with. Yes, they had also worked together several times. And I think the three of them all had a very healthy sense of humor about the parts they played. Well, I think um, they were certainly consummate professionals and had a sense of humor about the genre in which they performed. Um, I know that on the set of Comedy of Terrors and the remake of The Raven, they drove Roger Corman crazy playing practical jokes on one another. <laughs> Sarah, I want to I want to go back a little bit. You, you, where did the name you? Because your father was obviously born William Henry Pratt. And there's some mystery about where the name Boris Karloff came from. I mean, he never legally changed his name. No, he never did. Um, and there still is a mystery. Two years ago, an outstanding, definitively researched book called Boris Karloff: More Than a Monster, written by a British author, Stephen Jacobs, who spent ten years researching before the book was published has never been able to come up with a a name even vaguely resembling Karloff on either side of the family. So no one knows I don't where it know came where from. it came from. No, I don't know where it came from. Maybe my father did. The answer he always gave in, in interviews was that it came way back um, if, on his mother's side of the family, and Boris simply came from thin air. Interesting. I remember a story as far as the sense of humor your father had. Like sometimes he would see, like the the com he would see the comedy and what he did sometimes. And it's like in one horror movie they said they were filming his close up, and it was supposed to be a really chilling scene. And uh, Karloff turned to the camera and just yelled "boo." Oh, yeah, that was in Targets, I think. Yes. <laughs> that's a wonderful picture. Can you tell us anything about Targets? Uh? Oh, that's my favorite so, picture. Wonderful. That's my favorite uh, film. I think that Roger Corman had 10 minutes left of Karloff time and from a previous film or contract, and he assigned the task to Peter Bogdanovich to create a vehicle to use time. And Peter had never done such a thing before. Well, Peter not only wrote, but he directed and he acted in Target. And in in the film Target, my father plays an aging horror screen star. Brilliant casting. And um, it wasn't literally the last film my father made, but it certainly was the last film of merit, and it had great merit. Um, it the film is about a sniper. And um, um, unfortunately, it was released to the theaters at the time of the Bob Kennedy and Martin Luther King assassinations. Mm -hmm. So it was uh, pulled prematurely from the theaters. But it is available on DVD now. Uh, my father has a monologue uh, in, the, in the film, and he did it in one take. And the whole cast and crew stood up and applauded. 
my my uh, which brought tears to my father's eyes because it was a, essentially a wonderful exit line film for my father. Yeah, it's it, a great performance. It, yeah, it is a, a wonderful performance. It's a wonderful uh, story and film and well shot and, and well performed by Peter and the whole cast. And it's a film he uh, delighted in doing. He uh, admired Peter's creativity and talent and energy. And uh, the film ran in excess of 10 minutes of screen time of Karloff and I believe my father donated the balance of his time to the film because he admired uh, Peter's work so much. It's a great picture. It's one of, if not my favorite film. Do you like the Luton pictures too? The Val Luton pictures? Yes, very Did much. I love the Body talking? Snatcher. It's great. And, yeah, I, I, love, I love the Body Snatcher. And Bedlam, of course, is about a real asylum and really depicts the horrors that went on in, a, in an asylum at that time. And um, Isle of the Dead is is uh, a horrible, wonderful film. And everything Luton did was so atmospheric, and shooting it in black and all those films in black and white um, just added so much value to those films. Did your father ever speak about the uh, the very horrible, like long hours of makeup he had to put up with in those horror films? Well, he always, often talked about um, Jack Pierce being a makeup genius. And he and Jack worked together on, I think, 13 films. And, of course, the uh, makeup for Frankenstein took four hours in the morning and three hours at night. And the art of exact duplication for the camera, which does not lie, it was, um, of course spoke to Jack's genius and the patience of both Jack and my father each and every day. But um, and the, uh, the makeup was lead-based and um, they used no prosthetics. They used, um, you know, it had to be built up every day, layer upon layer for exact duplication for the camera. The mummy was, <clears throat> excuse me, almost as, as difficult a makeup for the role of Imhotep and it took almost as long to put, apply. And um, one day my father had a 19-hour day from start to finish. And But when they uh, finished applying the makeup, which had to be layer after layer of cotton and collodium and moisture and drying each layer with a hair dryer and, and then more of the same and more of the same to uh, reach the um, desired look for the mummy. And then when they finished applying, getting all the wrapping done, my father pointed out to them that they'd, they'd um, failed to include a fly. Oh, hilarious. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> and the shoes so were heavy, they, too, They had they? to make some adjustments since it was going to be such a hideously long day of shooting. Do you know, that's, that's a question I used to always wonder watching some of those horror films, especially The Mummy, like how they went to the bathroom. Well, <laughs> now you know. And, and Sarah, getting back to the Frankenstein makeup, the shoes, did I read that the shoes were 11 pounds? Um, they weighed something like that. I think 13 pounds. 13 pounds. And, he had and to... they, were, um, they were plaster boots. Wow. I and think... they only elevated his height by about not quite two inches. But it was all due to camera angle and shortening of the sleeves in the jacket. And as if he wasn't schlepping enough around with the, with the costume, he had to he had to carry Colin Clive, correct? Several times <laughs> up the back hill and drag him up the ladder in the tower, and that's what ruined my father's back. He already had a bad back, but that's what ruined his back permanently. Wow. Oh yeah, and there was take after take after take. Now, Done. your your father, as well as so many actors of that time period, were very mistreated by the studio. They they were taken advantage of, and so your father was actually one of uh, the main forces of developing Screen Actors Guild. I think my father was one of the twelve founding members of the Screen Actors Guild. His card number was number nine, and. Um, uh, he felt very passionate about his work 
as a founding member, although he was very quiet about it, quietly proud of it. But it was it was very dangerous work for those actors. They were putting their careers on line, and they ran the danger of never working again because they were forming a union in opposition to the uh, to the studios and the uh, the studio bosses and the directors and producers that they might never work again. And my mother told me the story one time that they would go to parties and park uh, park their cars um, blocks away from one another's houses when they'd have meetings and then walk to the meetings. And then they'd go to parties and they'd dance by one another on the dance floor and whisper, meeting Tuesday night at so-and-so's house and dance on by. I mean, it was extraordinarily uh, hazardous to their to their job to their profession but it was remarkable my father it was founded sag was founded in 1933 and my father remained on the board until into the mid to late 40s yeah i think your your father and james cagney and a yeah. bunch of others wasn't that ralph what? morgan lucille and jimmy gleason yeah wasn't bela an early member as well he was an early member, but not a founding member. I see. Well, I want to ask a question that I think most people would probably ask you many times. I mean, as a, as the daughter of the man who played Frankenstein, I mean, at what age did you did you realize this? I mean, I read somewhere that you 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 saw it the first time on television as well, the monster. At what age did you become aware that your dad was famous and that he was this iconic character? Well, you you know, my as I say, my father was didn't bring his work home he was very modest and self-effacing very humorous um it was very interesting to ride in a car with him and stop at a stoplight it was very interesting to ride in an elevator with him because people just didn't know whether or not to mind their manners or to take advantage of the captive situation but by and large they they um minded their manners and there was a lot of bad body language going on in the elevator turned around everybody was pointing and saying that's Boris Karloff that's Boris Karloff but um growing up it, you know he was he was my father and he would he'd be the first one to say a plumber probably couldn't act and I bloody well couldn't fix a sink <laughs> you know it was his job and that really was his attitude Back then, the press was less invasive. There were there was Hedda, Hedda Hopper and Luella Parsons, and they ran the Hollywood media, period. And so, you know, the children didn't read the magazines, etc. And, and a, a famous last name wasn't a big deal in Hollywood or Beverly Hills. Later, when I moved to San Francisco... Um, it, uh, a famous Hollywood name stuck out like a sore thumb, so you had to learn to cast your own shadow. Then it became a different matter, but um, it, 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 my father didn't carry his name on his shoulder, so his family didn't. I see. I heard a story um, that, I don't know if you know anything about this, I heard that Frank Sinatra once ran into Boris Karloff at a restaurant, and they started talking, and Boris Karloff said to Sinatra, who had just started uh, getting more and more into acting at that point, uh, your father said, you know how to sing with your voice, you have to learn how to act with your voice also. And that your father was giving Frank Sinatra acting lessons. Frank Jr. and I are good friends, and Frank tells me that's true. Great story. So Frank Sinatra learned acting from Boris Karloff. <laughs> well, I'm not saying he learned acting. I'm not saying he learned acting, but I'm telling you that Frank Jr. tells me that Frank Sr. told him that my father coached him. Wow. Good stuff. Yeah. Now, do you know... Any and I'm told also that Chris, um, who is it, Nicholson, I think, marks his scripts like my father uh, did. Oh, because, well, they acted together for Corman. 
in the terror right. and in one other film oh and in um uh, think, comedy of terror comedy no terror. in uh, the raven right the raven and i i think like nicholson said back then he was like you know he really was a kid and, yeah, he was. And to be around, like, uh, Karloff, Vincent Price, and Peter Laurie, he was just like, he felt like this annoying little kid around him. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's one person I've always wanted to meet is Jack Nicholson. But I never have. How did your father come to be an actor, uh, Sarah? I mean, there, the things I read on, on the Internet and doing some research about, about him and about you is that he supposedly lied about his experience. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> he was trained for the diplomatic service as because all his brothers were in the diplomatic service in in Great Britain, well, in China and India. One brother, having been knighted for a service in China, and my father always referred to him as my brother, the sir. And um, my father was formally educated for the diplomatic service. And um, he... he um, Ran away from home at age 21 with $100 in his pocket and wow. took a steamer, flipped a coin between Australia and British Columbia, wanting to be an actor. Shows you how much he knew about it. Never having had a, <laughs> an acting lesson, but having um, snuck into various theaters to see plays in London growing up. And so when he um, arrived in British Columbia, he thought he had a job um, with a farmer. The farmer didn't know he had a job, but he appeared at the farmer's door, and the farmer gave him a job, slept in the barn, and his his goal was to become an actor. So when he heard there was a, an audition um, with a repertory theater group, he uh, presented himself to the uh, repertory theater group's manager as an experienced British actor. And, you know, the Americans... And Canadians are will fall for anyone with a British accent. So <laughs> the mayor gave him a job, and um, um, my father told the story on himself that his his salary was thirty dollars a week when the curtain went up on his first performance, but it was fifteen dollars a week when the curtain came down on his first performance because it was completely clear he'd never stepped age before in his life but at least he still had a job wow. and he worked ultimately off and on for 20 18 20 years in repertory for three different repertory theater companies in um, british columbia sometimes being paid sometimes not doing three to five plays a, a week he was a quick study and fortunately and sometimes they build sets paint sets um Sometimes they, um, there was no work, and he'd dig ditches and work for the British Electric Company or the British Railway Company or learn to drive a truck, had no driver's license, of course. Um, did whatever it took to keep him starving to death for 18 to 20 years. But he learned his, tra he learned his craft there and eventually made his way down to um, Chicago and then and went back to British Columbia and then finally made his way down to San Francisco and eventually to Hollywood where for another 10 years he was um, an extra, as he said, third from the left in the fourth row and then did some bit parts and uh, um, was in uh, The Criminal Code in the play and then was cast in the film and uh, became a, a, a bit part player which is an improvement over an extra. But so, he had made 80 films amazing. Uh, before Frankenstein. It's a long journey. Long I, journey. 20 years. I, I heard James Whale, who could be a bit of an egotist and, <laughs> and very bitter and jealous of anyone else's fame, uh, used to sometimes angrily refer to Boris Karloff as, oh, that truck driver. Well, I heard that was Bela. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> Good enough. But I didn't say that. <laughs> However, uh, James Whale was uh, jealous of my father being the star of the film because 
James Whale was inordinately fond of Colin Clive, and he was supposed to be the star of the film. And I heard a story that um, your fa when your father was a starving actor, I think he was like hitchhiking or whatever out in L.A., and he was picked up by Lon Chaney Sr. He was standing um, in the rain waiting for a bus in front of the studio. And Lon Chaney Sr. picked him up and gave him what he considered to be the most valuable advice he ever got. And, and that was find something that nobody else is doing or is willing to do or can do and then do it better than anybody else. Wow. Great advice. Mm -hmm. And, and then, then your father basically uh, uh, got, he received like the mantle after uh, Cheney Sr. died of like the king of... No, Bela, Bela really did. Ba Bela and then was when first, Bela turned the down the job. Yeah. And then Bela turned down the job. And then my father was offered the part. And at that point, my father would have taken any role. I mean, he was a starving actor. Bela already was an established star in the stable. You know, I mean, that's what they were referred to by the studios. And Bela, of course, was uh, following in the footsteps of Cheney Sr. But the unfortunate decision that he made to turn down that role, then it was offered to my father. And history was made. Uh, uh, yeah, and, you know, one never knows how the film would have been received had anybody else played it. It would have been different. That's all anybody can say. And they said, too, when Lugosi had turned it down, it was a different movie uh, than the well, one... Well, it had a different director assigned to it. Yeah, I think uh, uh, Robert Flory was mm -hmm. going to direct it, and mm -hmm. the makeup was more like, looked like the golem. Uh, from the silent movies, and I think people who have seen Suppose the script, makeup. yeah, people who have seen the script and said one person said Lugosi was right in turning it down. Uh, the one that he was offered. Now, also, your father, aside from knowing Cheney Senior, also worked uh, several times with Lon Cheney Junior. I think they only worked together. Um, once on TV. Well, uh, yeah, that was um, uh, Route 66. Ow Owlet's right. I don't think wing. they made any films together. Uh, Owlet's, Owlet's Wing and Lizard's Tail. Is that the last mm -hmm. time he wore, he wore the monster? Right? Uh, yes, yeah. yes. Uh, Karloff put on the Frankenstein makeup and Cheney Jr. put on the Wolfman makeup for Route That's 66. Right. They worked together in one of those, like, Monster Mash type movies back then when Universal was in House of Frankenstein. Uh, Cheney Jr. was the wolf man and your father was the evil scientist uh, uh, Joseph Niemann. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, was that the I one remember. That, the one that made him leave Universal. Uh, well, I don't know. But did he ever, did you ever meet Cheney Jr., or did he ever speak no. of him? No. No. I know Ron Cheney, but no. My father never spoke of Cheney Jr., and he uh, really um, never, I have an interview where he speaks about uh, Bela, saying he was a fine actor, and he had great respect for him. Did he ever feel uh, Sarah type cast in, in, in horror films, uh, or was he was he grateful for the fame that it brought him and grateful to be working? Oh, he was very grateful for that role. It made such a pivotal difference in his life, both personally and professionally. And uh, he always said, you know, if if you find something you can do and you do it well and it brings you fame and fortune, why in the world would you spit on it? I heard a story that your father, in like the last days of his life, he was in a hospital bed, and he still had a voiceover that he had to do, 
So they brought the voiceover equipment to the hospital room. If I, I don't know if you remember if he ever spoke to you about this. But what I heard is they brought the voiceover equipment and your father said, isn't it wonderful, even at a time like this, to be doing something that you love? Well, that certainly is the way he would have felt. However, he, having died of emphysema, I don't know that he would have been able to do that. He, well, I heard like in his last movies, and, and that was also shows what a trooper he was, he would be uh, have an oxygen mask. Oh, yes, that's true. But I'm not sure the hospital would have allowed um, unsterile equipment into it. Yeah. I want to ask Sarah about what we were talking about before, Gilbert, about arsenic and old lace. Mm. Well, the, the, the joke in the in the play in the Broadway production was that he plays the ga- a homicidal gangster who goes into a yes, rage because people keep referring to him as as Karloff, mistaking him for Boris Karloff, which is a joke that they kept in the movie that Frank Capra made, even though Raymond Massey was playing the part and not your dad. And Gilbert and I were yes. discussing how the joke never works because it's not Boris Karloff. Right, right. Yeah, the the line was um, up. The uh, his sidekick asked him, "Why did you kill him?" And he said, "Because he said I look like Boris Karloff." Which the audiences must have loved when when he was in or the bought the house down every night. You yeah, know? the joke made no yeah, sense. Yeah, I don't know how it could possibly <laughs> work. Massey Raymond looked like Massey. Boris Karloff. Why didn't he do the uh, Why didn't he do the Capra film? Was he Was he They would not release him from the run of the play. I see. Oh, it's a shame. Mm-hmm. Oh, it Cause, is. It cause, is. It's a terrible shame. It's a fun little film, but what it's missing is Boris Garloff. And it would have been fun. Right. It oh, would, it would have been. It would have been fun watching him play off of Peter Laurie in that. And yes. Gary Grant, for that matter. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It would have been great fun. But, you know, that uh, you can't, you know, they weren't going to release him from the run of the play. Now, your father, at one point, he got so tired of like Universal's ba- Universal making and remaking the same films over and over under different titles. I think he went to either Columbia or RKO. RKO, I think. RKO, yeah. and he he wanted to do something different. And then I think he felt then once again they were like making the same films over and over again. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm not sure why he temporarily left Universal. I think it had, he had been promised a raise if he had made a certain film, he would get a raise on the next film, and he didn't, and so he walked. Oh, and I also, Uh, oh, go ahead. um, He was a man of great integrity. I heard that your father, also not making demands and... um, and being, uh, you know, hard worker and easy to work with, he was like, at one point in the Frankenstein series, they had developed boots that were much lighter than the ones he was used to wearing. And they said, we can make these for you. And he turned them down and said, no, that he was fine with the Frankenstein boots he was wearing. Well, that's something I never heard, but I don't. (laughs) You know, I have no way of knowing. I was not alive when those films were made. I was born when Son of Frankenstein was made. Is it true? Being made. Is it true, Sarah, that you really don't like scary movies yourself? I do not like scary movies. <laughs> the I'm a wuss. The daughter of Frankenstein. I'm a total like scary wuss. That's I leave the room during murder. She wrote. <laughs> That's wonderful. Now, your father, I also have vague memories. I think this was, wasn't was Man from Uncle. It, it was either Man from Uncle or, or Girl mm-hmm. from Uncle. Girl from Uncle. And, and he, he played a woman. Oh, and, yes. He played Mother Muffin. That's yes. Right, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Girl from Uncle. Oh, yes. And when they finished the makeup, he looked in the mirror and he said, I look like a two-bit whore. <laughs> 
I'm sorry to say that's actually how I discovered Boris Karloff was in the was in the Wild Wild West and and Route 66 and I Spy before I well, ever good. saw the, before I ever <laughs> saw the horror films. I mean, he was good in them, but before I ever, yes. before I ever saw Frankenstein when I was a kid. What I remember, he's good in those parts. He, he seemed to be having fun. Oh, he loved what he did. He absolutely loved what he did. I, you know, what so. I remember too. When, when your father passed away, I was a kid, and I, I looked in the newspaper, and um, there was, it said, you know, Boris Karloff dead at whatever age he died at, and there was a picture in full Frankenstein makeup of the actor Glenn Strange. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they, like, like, didn't even bother to find the right, uh, no, it was probably provided to them by Universal. Yeah. And I mean, I remember as a kid uh, being such a fan of those movies, right away I said, that's going strange. Yeah. Probably Universal provided them with the, with the uh, uh, photograph. They don't know. And I remember your father was also the villain in The Secret Life of Walter Mitty. Oh, yes. oh I know, oh, yes. with Danny Kaye. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Did he ever talk about that? That's Because he, he seemed like he enjoyed comedy. Oh, he did. He had a wonderful sense of humor. Wonderful sense of humor. He and my godmother used to exchange Christmas uh, gifts in garbage cans. <laughs> <laughs> So he had a dark sense of humor as well. <laughs> oh, he just had a lovely sense of humor. And he sent himself up, I mean, in, in things like Mad Monster Party. Oh, he really liked that, you know. Yeah, he took that, uh, you know, he, that was great. That I mean, was fun. I mean, his career was long enough that he got to parody himself, which must have been a treat. Oh, yeah, I mean, to turn around and that's like uh, Vincent and... Peter Laurie in 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 the Corman films, they got to spoof their own boogeyman image. Mm-hmm. That was great fun for them. And I read somewhere that you would, you would love to see Jeremy Irons play your dad. Is that right? Oh, that right? how wonderful that would be! be oh, that casting. would be wonderful. <laughs> be great casting. Did you see Gods yeah, and Monsters? Yeah, would be. Did you see the James Whale picture? Uh, the, yeah, yeah, Gods and Monsters. Yeah. Yes, I did. Oh, what did you think of that? Oh, I thought it was great. I mean, you know, I was delighted to see Whale get the, you know, the the credit and attention his his brilliant directing uh, deserves. I love the old dark house too. Speaking of Whale. Oh yes. Uh, oh, it's wonderful. Talk about atmospheric. Again. Yeah, it's a good one. Yes, it is. It's wonderful. It was hard to find that film. It was out of print or something. It was very difficult to find. For years, and it's got all, it's got that all star cast. Mel, Melvin Douglas is in it, and Charles yeah. Martin is in it, and, and 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 your dad is fun. Yeah, yeah. He looks like he's it having is. fun. It's, yeah, I mean, I love it when he slides open the window on the door. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's that's great. That's a great scene. And I just heard recently a recording of your dad and Beta Lugosi on a radio show singing a song called We're Horrible, Horrible Men. Horrible Men. Oh, God, horrible, horrible <laughs> I song. I have to see that. And it was so funny. You could see that, you could just hear that the two of them were enjoying, like, making fun of themselves. Oh, sure, why not? You know, uh, they, you know, they had a good time. There's somebody working on a project of Boris Karloff sings all the songs he sang on TV and on Broadway. Oh, my. <laughs> he <laughs> sang and danced. And it's funny because they and mentioned... the Peppermint Twist, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Was that on the Skeleton Show? Did he do... On the Skeleton yeah. Show. Yeah. And as a matter mm-hmm. of fact, there's an episode of The Honeymoon. That's right, where they reference Boris Karloff yeah, dancing yeah. on the Red Skeleton Show. He says something like, he goes... Uh, he goes, you know, when you see Boris Karloff and Frankenstein, that's Frankenstein. He goes, that's Boris Karloff. 
Not yeah. singing and dancing on the Red Skelton show. Right. I believe he's talking about his mother-in-law. Yeah. <laughs> he's using oh, Boris, how funny. Boris Karloff is an analogy. <laughs> Oh, how Great. funny. And I Great thought stuff. that was so classic and such an honor that he's immortalized in the Honeymooners. Oh, yeah. Well, he's immortalized in a lot of ways. I tell you, Sarah, doing research today and, and uh, just surfing the web and finding just all kinds of wonderful gems, and there's the This Is Your Life episode that you, that you yeah. are in. Yes, uh, and it's fascinating to see the, the the look on his face. Originally, he's waving when Ralph Edwards says, "Oh, Boris Karloff." And I think he, if you go and you watch it again, correct me if I'm wrong. He gives a little wave, like, "Oh, I'll acknowledge that I'm Boris yeah. Karloff." He doesn't he realize seemed, that yeah. he's actually the yeah, subject. Yeah, he thought he was being introduced because he was great <laughs> friends with Ralph and Barbara. He and my stepmother, and they were great friends. And very often they would watch the show from the wings. And so he was thought he was just being introduced, and he had always elicited a promise from Ralph that he, he would never make him a subject of the show. Never. Yeah. Because my father was a very modest, very private uh, person. And he was horrified. You could see it in his face. If you look, if you watch it and look, yeah. the second time he looks back and That's looks right. at my stepmother, he gives her a look that would... <laughs> oh, fry anybody. It is. It's and wonderful. he later said she sold him out for a washer and dryer. <laughs> Great stuff. It is. It's a, it's a double take. The first time he looks up, it's like Ralph is acknowledging him, and he says, oh, yes, yes, yes I'm Boris Karloff. Thank you very yes, much. Yes, hello, and this little wave, and then he looks over, and it's a triple take. Yeah. He looks over at my stepmother, and then he looks again, yeah. and when he realizes it, and it is a... Chilling look. That's wonderful. He's a guest. And the other thing I oh, found yeah. was the the other thing I found was the uh, was the color uh, a color makeup test of him with Jack Pierce clowning around with Jack Pierce. In the yeah, that's my home movie. That's oh, it's, on my home oh, movie. it's great. It's great. I urge our listeners yeah. to, to to find it because it's it's a funny well, it's copyrighted. It's not supposed to be findable. Oh, it's not. Forgive no. me. I found it on YouTube. I know, that's all right. I'm glad to know that it's findable because it's not supposed to be. It's copyrighted. Yeah. And that that's wonderful stuff. It's yeah, great that, to see him. And He's sticking again his tongue speaks out. To Jack, it again speaks to Jack Pierce's genius because it the greenish tint of the makeup was developed by Jack because he knew that then on black and white film it would come across as the deathly gray. That's a great clip. And it's funny because now when they'll draw, do cartoons or uh, any kind of Frankenstein appearance on a color film, they make him green, forgetting yeah. that the whole point was that he looked gray. That's black right. black and white. That's right. Even That's, the, even so the, the green is an error, really. Even in the color Munsters pictures, the, Fre oh, the yes. Fred Gwynn yes. version of Frankenstein is green. That's right. Sarah, you know what I was going to ask you about? Now, this is, is, the, is the Internet uh, uh, letting me down again, or was, was your father's mm -hmm. favorite actor really George Kennedy? Yes. That's fascinating. Did they have a relationship? No. Were they friends, or he just admired his work? He just admired his work. And I met George Kennedy um, at a show several years ago, and I had the opportunity to tell him that, and he cried. Oh, that's wonderful. Oh, my God. Yeah. He said he had wished he'd met my father. And one time in New York, my father was across the street walking someplace, came out of a stage door, I guess. And George didn't. He said he almost walked across the street to meet him and he hadn't. And he'd always wished he had. Wow. And, and yeah, and I loved the fact that I told him. Also on that, this is your life. What they brought out. Jack Pierce, the yeah. makeup genius from all those movies, and your your father was so appreciative, and he gave. He, I think. Oh yeah. Yeah, he said, "Greatest makeup man in the world. I owe him a lot." That's right. My father genuinely meant that. And then uh, later on, I think Jack Pierce wound up. Well, he was kicked out by Universal after all. Oh yeah. And oh he, yeah. He wound up being a makeup man on on Mr. Ed. 
the Tokyo that's what Palace. he was doing. That's what he was doing when he they made um, "This Is Your Life." Yeah, and the Westmores had taken over by then. And when, oh, when, yeah. when Mel Brooks made the spoof, when he made Young Frankenstein. Uh, they could, they, yes. <laughs> oh, you're, you're groaning. <laughs> oh, I love it. Oh, I so love what, it. Oh, it's it's a just my favorite film in the world. It's wonderful. It didn't translate well into a play, but it was my favorite fan of the film in the world. It's a wonderful picture. But they didn't have the rights to the, peer, to the Pierce makeup. Is that correct? Because the Peter, I have no Peter, idea. Peter Boyle, Gil, of course, you wouldn't know this. The, Gil, the, yeah. Gil, the makeup, the, the Peter Boyle's makeup is not Jack Pierce's yeah, makeup. Yeah, no, at all. no. Oh no, they, it isn't. But it wasn't. It wasn't supposed to be. Really, I mean, come on. There's no stable in um, Frankenstein. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> How did your father feel about uh, seeing uh, the monsters? I'm not sure he ever did. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, assume he had a low opinion. He would have had a low opinion of it. Now, he, he didn't take part in Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein, but he did later on join them for Abbott and Costello Meet Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Did Correct. he ever talk about Abbott and Costello? I don't remember. Sarah, I wait, just wanted wait, to ask wait. you about about him referring to Halloween and Christmas as his busy season. Yes, yes, uh, and, and it will be. He did refer to it, and I refer to it as mine too. Because of the Grinch. Well, Christmas because of the Grinch. Yes. Right. Right. And and he was. It, some people thought the, the the an actor named Thurl Ravenscroft actually sang. He did. In the movie. He is uh, yes. the one who sang yeah. it. Right. The, who was also the voice of Tony the Tiger. In, in, That's right. Interestingly. That's absolutely right. For you trivia buffs listening. And he was, uh, your dad was sometimes incorrectly credited with act, with, with singing uh, in That's the right. But he was. Me, meanwhile, it was a baritone voice. Right. <laughs> <laughs> if he pulled that off, he really would have been a renaissance man. Right. And that, right. No. The Grinch still lives on to this day. That's what an amazing classic that is. That every oh, Christmas. It pl it's played every year. The Grinch, yeah, it's played every Christmas. It's a wonderful legacy for his family. It's a wonderful piece of work. Oh, it is. It's just, it's, it's delightful. It's enchanting. It's everything it should be. I, I still get choked up and emotional watching it all these years later. Yeah, for, it's 40, just, 40 years it's after just I lovely. First saw it. Look, when your father says, and his heart grew three times larger that it's day, brilliant. It's it's, brilliant. it really is the moment you choke up. Oh, yeah. And, you know, what's wrong with he has garlic, he had garlic in his soul. That's a lovely line. Love yes. <laughs> Don't we all know people like that? <laughs> Well, also the rhymes. I mean, the difficulty of the of that dialogue and, and the challenge it must have been for him, and how how effortless how effortlessly he pulls it all off. And changing from one to the other, from the narrator to the grant. Absolutely, it's 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 just a it's just a great performance. It's a, a classic all time performance. Yeah, and, it is. I, I'm very proud. Of and Chuck Jones, okay. I think that's right. Yeah, was yeah. the did who was the oh yeah yeah behind Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck. You can't mm -hmm. do better than a collaboration of Chuck Jones and Boris Karloff. It's well, and how unlikely. <laughs> <laughs> this, is a, this is a timeless piece of work. Yeah. No, it was, it was wonderful. Well, Absolutely. Well, Sarah, and mm -hmm. we, we had met, uh, of course, at, at uh, Chiller Convention. Mm -hmm. I'm site. going to be there this October. Oh, okay. I'm there. I'm there every year. I'm just like a bad penny. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember my son met you, who was four years old. He looked at you, and he looked at a photograph of Frankenstein, your father as Frankenstein, and looked at you very seriously and said, you don't look like your father. <laughs> I'm so glad he said that. Great. I would have had to eat him. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. 
Well, Sarah, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate this. Uh, well, you, it's been lots of fun. Thank you very, very much. It's been a treat, Sarah. Thanks for doing it. Oh, my pleasure, really. It's been lots of fun. So, and I'm not, I'm not sure I understand what a podcast is any more than when we began, but I don't think I need to. <laughs> you Can I tell you something? I'm the host, and I don't really know what this <laughs> Oh, good. That's nice. I, good does numbers. Frank know what it is? Do you know what it is? Not I I can't operate my cell phone. So oh, this podcast. Oh, good. We have we have a nine year old that comes in and shows us everything. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad. So, I'm so glad that I won't be expected to to do anything about it. I'm so glad. So I'm Gilbert Gottfried, and my co-host uh, Frank Santo Padre. The first time I got his name right. That's a, that's a. And, <laughs> <laughs> this is Gilbert Gottfried's amazing, colossal podcast, and we've been speaking to Boris Karloff's daughter, his pride and joy, Sarah Karloff.